All right, it looks like our numbers have slowed down. So we are gonna go ahead and get started. And my name is Amy Hester. I'm a museum educator for the Florida Museum of Natural History. And if you are joining us from Gainesville, we are meeting on the land and the territories of many nations, including the Seminole and the Temecula people. Welcome to the second virtual Mushrooms with the Museum event. Today's topic is deadly insect pathogens and lovable lichens. You will notice that you are muted and your cameras are turned off and that's because we are using the Zoom webinar feature. The chat is gonna remain open the entire time. So if you have questions for your panelists, you can drop them right into the chat. Um, please make sure that you're staying respectful to everybody on the session. And then if you have, uh, let's see, and you need to make sure that you address it to all panelists and attendees, because maybe people are asking the same questions, but we aren't seeing them. There will be two opportunities for you all to ask questions. So if you put them in chat, I'm going to be recording them. And then after the first speaker, we're going to open it up to some questions. And then again, after the second panelist, we will open it up again. So you can put the questions in throughout the whole event. And then at the end of the program, a survey is going to appear for all of the participants and your grownups to tell us what you thought about the time that we've spent together. Um, please take a few moments to help us out with that. And now that we are all caught up and everyone is here, I am going to kick it over to Matt Smith. He is the museum's curator of fungus and an associate professor at the, um, of plant pathology. And he's gonna fill us in a little on Mushroom 101 and then introduce our other panelists. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi everybody, it's great to be here. I'm gonna uh, share a little slideshow for you while I'm talking. Um, so let me get that queued up. Um, and so, yeah, it's a really great, a, a great pleasure to be here for the Mushrooms in the Museum event. Today we have um, two special guests that are gonna be talking with us about deadly insect pathogens and lovable lichens. Once again, um, I'm Matthew Smith, and I am in the Department of Plant Pathology at the University of Florida, and also the curator of the Fungus Collection. And you can see my email there. Um, we have our contacts for everybody listed also on the website of the event, so you can check that out. Uh, but I'm gonna take just a couple of minutes here and just go through some, some really basic things to help orient everyone to make sure everybody knows some basics about fungi before we really get into these two special topics. First, I want to point out that I, the two special people who are with us today are Laurel Kaminsky, who's a lichen expert, and Joao Arujo, who is an entomopathogenic fungi expert. So they're going to talk for um, a little bit about their, their special topics, but I just want to talk briefly about fungi in general, because not everybody spends as much time as I do thinking about fungi. I spend a lot of my time thinking about them, and I find that many people don't necessarily know um, really basic things about fungi. So I'm just going to go over them really quickly. So the first and really most important thing I think to know is that fungi are not just weird plants. Some of us, when we were in um, school, learned about fungi as sort of plants that didn't get the message uh, that they were supposed to be doing photosynthesis and things like that. But fungi are a unique kingdom all of their own. And that's really important to remember and um, something you can take away from this program if you didn't know that. And there's a lot of different words that people use for, for fungi. So things like mushrooms, molds, truffles, and yeasts, those are all just different kinds of fungi. And it's there's a couple things you need to know about fungi. So first, they're eukaryotes, which just means that they're like us in that inside of their cells, they have a nucleus and they have other organelles, um, which makes them sort of similar to us in many ways. They also are heterotrophic, and that just means they obtain their nutrients from other organisms. So that means they don't do photosynthesis like plants do. Um, and then another thing that's really interesting about fungi is they have what we call indeterminate growth. So theoretically, an individual fungus can live and keep growing sort of forever, uh, which is pretty, pretty interesting. And then another thing that's really important to know is that fungi obtain their nutrients in a pretty different way from we, how we do. They um, tr get their nutrients from absorption. So they secrete these enzymes, usually outside of their body or right up growing into whatever it is they're eating. And then they slurp up the nutrients um, that the enzymes are breaking down. So that's pretty different. We ingest our food, of course. And so this 
this form of absorption is pretty different. And that's something that is pretty much shared by all fungi. So another thing that's really interesting and important to know is that fungi, most of them are multicellular and their bodies are made up of these microscopic filaments that are called hyphae. These are just two different images showing you what hyphae look like. They grow at their tips and sometimes you'll hear about them when you have a lot of hyphae together called a mycelium. And there are some fungi that are unicellular and you might've heard of some of those, especially the yeasts. So yeasts are unicellular fungi that don't have flagella, so they can't really move around and they reproduce by budding. And then there are some fungi that are, have actually modal flagellated spores called zoospores. So that's important to know as well. And so there's a couple more things you should know. Most fungi reproduce by spores and a lot of those fungi make both asexual and sexual spores. And this is an example of a nematode trapping fungus um, in the genus Orbilia shown here. And this is a nematode that's being eaten by this fungus. And on the right are some pictures of the asexual spores of this fungus. And then on the left are some pictures of the sexual form of this fungus. It's a little teeny cup fungus um, growing on wet wood. So there's a lot of different things that these fungi can do and producing spores is one thing that's really important for reproduction and dispersal. And of course, some fungi make these really big fruiting bodies with millions of spores and then others don't make any spores or fruiting bodies at all. So that's the example here are the yeasts that are used to brew beer and wine, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And then just two more things that I think that you should know about fungi before we get into um, some of these exciting things about lichens and entomopathogenic fungi is that the fungi make these fruiting structures, but they're usually ephemeral. And this is a little bit confusing because we tend to think about the mushrooms that we see or the fruiting bodies that we see in the environment as the body of the organism, but really the body of the organism is these microscopic hyphae. So if you think about the analogy with plants, uh, when you see the tree of an apple tree, that's clearly the body of the organism. And if you show up on the right day, you might find an apple and that's the fruiting structure. And it's the similar idea with the fungi where the body of the organism is, those, is the mycelium or the hyphae, and they might be in the ground, they might be in wood, they might be inside of plants or in insects. And the fruiting structure is just the reproduction part where you find the spores. And the last thing that I, I want to tell you, there's two more things. The one is that fungi are really closely related with animals and not very closely related with plants. So we're kind of cousins uh, to the fungi. And then one more thing is that we have a lot of diversity of fungi. So there are about 110 described species of fungi, um, but this is really just the tip of the iceberg. And we know from a bunch of different um, evidence that there's a lot of undiscovered diversity about fungi, uh, somewhere between 1.5 and 5 million species. So I'm gonna turn it over to some of our experts and they're gonna tell you about some of the special groups of fungi uh, that, that we're still learning about today. So uh, Laurel, I'm gonna give you access to the screen and let you go for it with your presentation about lichens. So everybody, please welcome Laurel Kaminsky. Hi everyone, so great to be here. Um, got super excited to talk about lichens. Um, let me just pull up my PowerPoint here. Okay, um, so today, uh, can everybody see my, my PowerPoint? Okay, um, so today I'm gonna be uh, sharing some cool things about the lovable li lives of lichens. And I think lichens are super fascinating organisms. Um, and there's a lot of really cool biology and um, morphology to cover. So first off, and this is gonna be a somewhat interactive PowerPoint as, as much as can be. So feel free to use the chat um, and answer these following questions. So is Spanish moss a lichen? This is something 
that stuff that's hanging from the tree is super common in Florida, but is it a lichen? Oftentimes on trees, there's a lot of green things, um, but is this, is the picture of this a lichen? And then lastly, um, is reindeer moss a lichen? In particular, I'm talking about all the stuff, all these little green clumps growing on the ground. So the answer to this one is no, Spanish moss is actually a, a plant. It's a type of bromeliad, although the scientific name Tillandsia usneoides is probably named after the lichen genus Usnea because it's very long and pendant. This green stuff on a tree made from a distance look like lichen, but it's actually a moss. And this species is Octo, this genus is Octoblepharum. And then lastly, reindeer moss. Yes, that's a lichen. And so if we were looking really close at this, um, you would often see on the top left, Cladonia leparina and Cladonia evansii in the top right. And these are both really common ground dwelling lichens in Florida. And so lichens, one cool thing about lichens is just that they grow almost everywhere. Um, the lichens uh, in Florida grow mostly on bark. We don't have a lot of other types of substrate. You can find them on mangroves, on twigs, on trunks. They love bark. Um, lichens also grow on rock. And maybe out west, you've seen this really beautiful yellow one. Or maybe um, in the east, you've seen these big greenish things on rock. They're also really common around the world. Um, lichens also grow on the ground. Have you, if you've ever been to the Mojave Desert or um, the Columbia Basin in Utah or Wyoming or Idaho or east of the Cascades Mountains, um, there's a lot of things that just grow on soil. And this is what it looks like close up. This soil stuff is actually a mixture of cyanobacteria, free living fungi. But if you look really closely, in the middle, you'll see these like brownish spots with these white rims, lichen, and then there's little splotches of yellow and like a light, there's little light bluish dots towards the back that are also lichens. Lichens grow on leaves. This is mostly a tropical thing. The leaves have to be long living, but you know, there might be some on temperate uh, spruces or pines, things that don't lose their needles. In Florida, you can find them on privet, uh, magnolia, and also hollies. And lichens also grow everywhere from the tropics to Antarctica. In fact, some of the uh, species that live closest to the South Pole are lichens and they live embedded in rocks. And so lichens also like human made substrates such as cars and shoes. So here's another question for y'all. Here's a picture of a 1977 Ford Bronco. How many lichen species do you think are, have, were documented on this car door? And then lastly, secondly, what do you think is the most species of lichens that has ever been found on a single tree? So on this Ford Bronco, there were 40 species of lichen. Uh, this was a car door in Puerto Rico. And of those 40 records, nine were new to Puerto Rico, were species that had never been found in Puerto, Puerto Rico before. And then in a tree in Papua New Guinea, 173 species of lichens were documented. Of course, this is a giant podocarp tree. So you know, there's a lot of diversity, but still 173 species, that's pretty cool. So, what exactly is a lichen? You know, the thing that, the phrase that people really use is when Freddie Fungus met Alice Algae, they took a lichen to each other. Well, first off, the, that's not quite true. The fungus and the algae aren't like male and female, you know, and also like for reproduction, like the fungi and algae have strains. They don't really, neither of them have sexes. So in some ways, Freddie Fungus and Alice Algae is a little bit binary and, and 
outdated. Um, but it's what's correct about this is that uh, lichen is primarily a fungus and an algae that um, have made a co-evolved um, relationship. And so this is what a lichen cross section looks like. And the top is um, a fungal layer that's only, it's only fungal. And on the bottom is only fungal. In the middle is a layer that has fungal hyphae and also the photosynthesizing partner. And that the fungus is usually an ascomycete, occasionally um, a basidio. So most of them make like little cups or little pimple like reproductive structures. Um, and the photosynthesizing partner is a green algae or a cyanobacteria. Um, one other cool thing about a lichen is that a lichen really isn't an organism. You can't, um, it's, it's like two different organisms that are, are like, have joined in a way that makes a structure that resembles neither free living. If you look at this diagram, on the left is the fungus free living and on the right is the algae. But that lichen in the middle, that cladonia doesn't look like either. And so a lichen isn't really an organism. It's, it's like these two components that make like a totally new structure. And we don't really know how to make a lichen in the lab. We know how to separate some of the species, but not a whole lot. Um, and so this kind of begs the fact like the inquiry, like, well, what's going on? And so when Freddie Fungus met Alice Algae, they took a liking to each other, but now their marriage is on the rocks. Or it's at least a little different because we know that lichens have more than two symbionts. Um, there's a whole host of bacteria, other fungi, and sometimes even multiple photosynthesizing partners. So just like how humans have a lot of gut um, fungi and bacteria, so do lichens. And so uh, in some ways, a, a lichen is an ecosystem and it's much more than just these two components. And so another really interesting question that uh, I got a lot about lichens is like, well, are lichens truly lovable? Because, well, in some ways they're very pretty, so they are lovable, but is a lichen a mutualism um, is what lovable usually refers to. And so a mutualism would be like when they're both the components are helping each other. In the case of a lichen, the fungus is sheltering that algae because the algae is in the middle layer. And so it gives the algae a place to live. But, and the algae also provides a photosynthetic food source that that fungus couldn't get by itself. So that would be why people would think it's uh, a mutualism. But sometimes what, what's also in the literature is that a lichen could be like a controlled parasitism where like the fungus is forcing the photosynthetic partner to do the farming. It's saying, oh, here, you know, we'll give you some here, you know, like come help us. And it just kind of does all the, it, the algae or the cyanobacteria does this work but doesn't really get much of a reward for it. Um, and some of the proof for that is that sometimes the fungus can be free living. This picture here is Stictus. Um, it's a lichenized but also unlichenized fungus. On the left, it's living free living as a saprobe, and on the right, it's as a lichen. Free living, lichenized fungi that are free living also is super rare, but maybe we just need to do a lot more sequencing to figure out how common it is. There's lots of different growth forms of lichens. Um, the, the one that you'll see most off, well, you'll see three of these super often, um, but in Florida, especially if you look really hard at twigs um, or if you're in South Florida, crustose lichens are really common. On the left, we have this lichen, uh, Herpophallon rubrosinctum, and crustose lichens are really tightly adhered to the bark. You can't really separate the lichen from the bark um, without taking a chunk of the bark. 
Um, folios lichens are contained lobes. So they have, you can see they look almost like leaf-like little structures around the edges. And these lobes can either be tightly or loosely adhered to the bark. But unlike a crustus lichen would not have lobes. Then there's fruticose lichens, which are more three-dimensional. You can think of them as being attached to a substrate at one or many points, but then they move out um, in many different directions from that substrate. And then lastly, there's squamulus lichens, which are not too common in Florida, um, but they look like almost like little scales that are just kind of angled up away from the substrate. Uh, on the left is Phyllopsera, which is super common in Florida. And on the right, um, you'll see like right on the, along the wood are these little squamules. And these squamules are one of the main comp uh, components of the lichen genus Cladonia. Uh, and so the Podesia are, are Cladonia specific. But they often have like little squamules either on the substrate or on the Podesia. So lichens have many different ways to reproduce, but what I think is really most important uh, or most interesting is just how many, just how pretty these shapes can be. So most lichens are ascomycetes, so they'll either make little cups or like little pimple-like things. And in these are um, the spores, are in these little sacs called assi, which are then in these cup or pimple-like shapes, apothecia or parathesia. And so here is a picture of a graphus species. And these is a, this is a really kind of cool squiggly modified apothecia. And these lichens are also called script fungi, or sorry, script lichens because it looks like writing. Some apothecia have holes um, and then this is the Parmetrema perforatum group, and there's a couple of species in Florida, but they're just really big and very showy. Um, here's another apothecia, and it's very tan and very smooth. There's no like hairs on its side. And then oftentimes these structures have different colors to them. So on these, all the little circles have this brownish, maybe bluish, uh, disc in the middle, but then the edge is a different color. Um, it seems to be greenish. And you'll see a lot of these in Florida. This is a Brigantia or Latratia. And then lastly, uh, here's an example of a pimple, a parathesia lichen, and it's got little, um, it's got um, the parathesia are actually embedded in it, so you can't really see the pimples, but it's a really cool lichen that grows on rocks in Florida. Lichens also have a lot of ways to reproduce asexually. They can do, um, uh, but the main thing about asexual reproduction is that they contain both the fungus and the photosynthesizing partner. They can either look like powdery stuff, ceridia, or like little finger-like projections, which are isidia. Um, and if you, now you've got your eyes out for like different forms and shapes. If you ever see this lichen in Florida, please let me know or let somebody in the museum know because we think it's an endangered species. And this is Cora tamakua, which um, hasn't been collected since 1985. You'll probably find it in like really pristine old growth uh, sand pine scrub with a lot of lyonia and oaks. And so lastly, I just wanna talk a little bit about like ecosystem services that lichens provide. Um, and so if you have any ideas for what lichens do, you can type them in the chat. But some of the ones that I think are most important are water retention. This picture on the left is a one of a lichen that's um, mostly dry. And then when it's super wet, you can see just how much it expands. So they can hold many times their weight in water. 
Grass also helps to minimize erosion. Um, they also provide habitat for larger organisms like birds and squirrels, and also provide habitat for smaller organisms like water bears, tardigrades, and also other fungi and bacteria. Sometimes lichens are a food source, and lichens also provide camouflage for other organisms to survive. The, uh, this is a praying mantis that was photographed by uh, a, a student, a former grad student at UF, and this was in Gainesville, Florida. It's a, it's a praying mantis that mimics lichens. And then on the right is an assassin bug that uses the coloration of lichens to make shelter for itself, but also can maybe sneak up and then not move and attack its prey. And so lastly, um, how many moths do you see in this photograph? Thinking about camouflage. Well, there's actually two different ones. You can, and so this was, lichens are very important because um, they were used to help um, in evolutionary studies. Um, basically pollution killed the lichen, which changed the phenotype or the morphology, the ratios of, of, the, of, the, of the lighter and darker moths in uh, England. And so that based on that, that also gave um, evidence for how natural selection works. And so in summary, um, lichens are really pretty and they're super diverse. They've got lots of shapes. Um, they grow all around the world and they provide lots of different ecosystem functions. And so a couple of resources that I think are really cool, especially if you're in Florida, are these two keys here. Um, and Amy can share them with you in the chat. Um, these are keys that uh, collaborators or myself wrote. One is really good for natural area teaching laboratory on campus. And the other is a preliminary key to species in Florida. Um, and then also we have, a, I made a scavenger hunt um, and so if you're around Gainesville, you should just check it out. Or even if you're not in Gainesville, you should just go out in the woods someday and just see like if you can just find everything on that checklist and then tweet, tweet about it or um, send me an email and I can check it. <laughs> and so with that, thank you very much. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Laurel. And we have a lot of great questions coming in. And I just want to give a shout out to Sarah Prentiss, who has been um, monitoring the questions for me and putting them in a document. But she's also been the one that has been giving the links out on chat. So all the good information is coming from uh, Sarah Prentiss, who's been fantastic. So I'm going to go ahead with um, three questions for now before we go to our next panelist. And then we can always come back for more at the end. Um, but one that came up pretty early when you asked about Spanish moss, and we know now that it's a bromeliad, but um, people are wondering, is there a benefit to Spanish moss? Yeah, so Spanish moss um, also is a habitat for oh, um, other trees. Um, sorry, Spanish moss is a habitat for other organisms and um, it does retain some water. We've done some study, but not as much as lichens. And so, yeah, it's not hurting the tree though, but okay. it, maybe it's not helping it. Fantastic. Um, and then we have some that are a little more scientific. Um, Dan has asked, don't many lichen have both ASCO and Basidiomycete? I could be saying those words wrong. No, no, well, no, a lichen species will never, will only, the fungus will only be an ascomycete or a basidiomycete. Um, but lichens have evolved multiple times throughout the course of evolution. And so I think there's been at least seven, probably more times that a lichen form has, has um, evolved. But it, it, yeah, you'll never find something that has both a basidio and an asco form. 
All right, and I think that you might have answered this one, but um, just for clarification, Karen asked if the algae or the fungus that make up the lichen, are they able to live separately? And you had used an, a word that some are unlichenized. So I feel like they can, but can you clarify that? Yeah, so some species can. It's tricky because like we, we still need a lot of sequencing to figure out like what is free living and what isn't, but it seems to be most of the time that a fungus is cannot be free living from its lichenized state. And most of the time, an algae cannot be free living from its lichenized state. But there are rare occurrences where either component can be free living. All right, fantastic. And I'm going to throw out one more question, but you don't have to answer now. I'd like for you to think about it for the end, because this one might take some thought. But Matthew wants to know, do we know of any diseases slash fungi that could cause a post-apocalyptic scenario that is often depicted on TV shows or movies? So something to think about while we go to our next one. And for the scavenger hunt, just to, to mention um, that that is going to be on the event um, site on the museum website. So I'll, I'll throw that out there in the chat while Matthew um, introduces our next speaker. So thank you all and keep adding questions. We will have more time for questions at the end. Thanks. All right, great. Well, it's nice. We'll still have time to talk about lots of things. I saw some other questions that we might need to get to later too. So um, I'm really glad everyone can join us and we're gonna switch gears to a, a really different group of fungi. Um, and so I'll just introduce Joao Arujo who's gonna talk with us about entomopathogenic fungi. So fungi that make their living um, off of eating insects. Joao? Well, thank you, Matt, and thank you, the Florida Museum, for the invitation to be talking about these uh, amazing organisms. So today I will be talking about the entomopathogenic fungi, which are fungi that are able to parasitize and, and feed from insects. So we know a lot about other fungi. Most of the fungi are saprophytic fungi, and others are plant parasites or making a mycorrhizal association with uh, plant roots and plants and providing more nutrition for plants. And also as lichens, as we could see in the previous um, presentation, but we know very little about the, the fungi that are associated with insects. So today I will be showing a little bit of these uh, amazing organisms. They are really fascinating and beautiful. As you can see here, they, they can infect a really broad range of hosts from uh, flies to uh, moths to beetles and many other groups. So first I will be uh, giving a, a, a pr broader perspective on, on the diversity of these fungi. For example, the microsporidians, which are uh, obligate parasites, intracellular parasites of uh, insects and many other animals, including humans. So these fungi here, can, can infect humans as well. And to infect the, the host, they will get ingested by the host. And once these fungi spores are inside the, the, the gut of the host, it will trigger uh, like a harpoon, as we can see here on the right uh, picture. We see this really long thread, it's uh, actually a harpoon. And as soon as these cell get in touch with the whole cell, this uh, harpoon will be injecting the, the, in, uh, the, the content of the cell inside the whole cell. And then on the letter B, C, and D, as we can see here on the, on the left side on this cycle, and the, the fungus will develop inside the whole cell, mature, multiply inside the whole cell, and once it is filled with these parasitic cells, the whole cell will burst and release more spores to infect other hosts. And Another case is the, the chytrids, it, which are um, aquatic fungus. And in this case here, uh, Coelomomyces, they infect two different hosts, the copepods and the mosquitoes. And they start their life cycle in the mosquito, on the copepod, sorry. And once they get inside the copepod, many of these cells will start to multiply. And again, once this host, host body is um, filled with these fungal uh, cells, 
it will burst and will release these cells on the on the on the water. And once these cell, uh, motile cells are on the water, flying, uh, not flying, swimming, and they get together and they fuse. And these fused cells will then in, uh, infect a mosquito larva. And once inside a mosquito larva, they do the same thing. They can or either fill the host body and kill them, or in the case of these species, if the, the fungus remain inside the host body, it will uh, stay there until they get to the adult phase. So they get infecting the larval stage and they remain inside the mosquito until they get into the adult phase. And once the, these adults get the first blood meal, once they, they, they feed from the blood from, from us, for example, they, these fungal cells that are inside the, the mosquito will mature and will become uh, bags of filled with these uh, flagellated cells. And then the insect will lay uh, these sporangia with um, fungal spores instead of their own eggs. And here is just to uh, example, uh, illustrate a little bit how the, the, these uh, flagellated cells looks like. This is not the same species, but this can bring us the idea of how many they can be and how fast they are. So they are really many in the water as soon as they are released by, by these ho dead hosts. Another interesting case is the Entomophthora mycota, which is a, a really strange name, but they, they, they are really incredible fungi, which are one of the very, very few lineages of entomopathogens that can shoot spores and produce spores while the host is still alive. So as we can see in the video here, you can, you can see that the, the, the cicada, it's lacking half of the body, almost half of the body, and this white mass of uh, fungal cells is just releasing spores as the host walk. So it's basically a zombie walking up from the stick and shooting spores for the fungus. And another case is Septobasidium, which is one of the very, very few cases of fungi that are related to mushrooms. They are called basidiomycetes, this group, at, that can infect insects. So in this case, the fungus grow on top of, of the, the insect host, but they don't kill the insect. They just uh, grow uh, hyphae, which are these fungal, fungal filaments. And then these fungal filaments will invade the host body. And then the host that feeds from the plant will get these nutrients from the plant and the fungus will uh, absorb these nutrients from the plant, but living inside the insect. So the, the fungus is making the insect as a slave for them. As the fungus, as the insect feed from the plant, the fungus just stole, steal these nutrients from the insect. So it's really unique association. And among those uh, entomopathogens, that fungi that infect insects, we have the ascomycota or hypocarialian fungi, as we call this group. And those including the zombie ant fungi, which are now very famous among the fungi. And here we see a really big diversity and large diversity when they, these fungi infect many different types of ants. And here there are the four most uh, common uh, different groups. On the left side, we see the zombie ants, the classic zombie ants that uh, walk up and, and bite into this uh, plant part to shoot the spores, as I will show later. But these other ones are also uh, ants that are infected by, by a very, very close related fungus, but they are not zombie ants because they don't have their uh, behavior manipulated. But the classic case of the zombie ant is when a fungus of your cordyceps unilateralis, they infect this, uh, the, the host and the host, the host climb up into a, a plant part and bite into this plant part. And a few days later, uh, they will, the, the fungus will start to grow from the back of the host and will form this, what uh, it's uh, uh, popularly and commonly called as fruity body, are those that are not fruits. They are just spore producing structures, which we technically call uh, cinema, the sexual, and the ascoma, the sexual. So if we take a closer look to this structure, which is very round and has these, all these uh, dots are actually peritisia, 
which we saw in the last in the last presentation, some uh, lichens produce perti uh, pertissium as well, and, and in this case they are also reproduced through pertissia. So to see the pertissia and describe the species, we have to cut this uh, uh, this fungal structure, and and then as we cut them uh, longitudinally, we can see these uh, pertissia all arranged. And these pertissia will shoot spores into the environment and eventually infect other uh, insects and other hosts that are passing through. But these uh, fungi only infect one species. So one species of uh, fungus infect one species of insect. So they're really uh, very, very specific. And as we have uh, studied these fungi for many, many years, we have been describing lots of new species here I'm just including uh, uh, many examples of how uh, scientific uh, description of a species looks like. So we collect these fungi in the forest, take them to the lab, and then we make sections of these tiny structures, the fruiting bodies, and then we look them under the microscope. And once we can see these uh, really tiny details, we can then describe these species, compare, measure structures, and then compare these our findings with other species that were already described. If they are different, we then propose and write a scientific uh, uh, manuscript, of a scientific article, and then we propose them as a new species if they are different. And to collect these species, the scientists like me and Laura and, and Matt, we have to travel, have to travel across the, the world to find these species. We went to different uh, forests like the Amazon or Africa, Asia. And in order to study these fungi, we have to do it as they are still fresh, because if they are uh, dead and they, we bring them from to the lab, they will be dead and shrink and dry. And we cannot observe uh, many of the, the structures we want. So we need to study them as they are still alive. So in many cases, as we can see here on the, the bottom left and upper up uh, right, we see these two pictures where I had to, to make a, a laboratory in the boat in the Amazon or make a laboratory in a hotel room in Africa, for example. So we have to collect this fungi in nature and study them really quickly, sometimes still in the forest or back in a hotel room, for example. And here I want to invite you to watch this uh, short video to uh, about two and a half to three minutes and showing the, how beautiful these fungi are. And it, at the end of this uh, video, there will be uh, like uh, another video showing different types of insects infected as well. Yeah, so they're, they're not only infecting uh, ants, but infecting many other insects. And one of the, the most interesting aspects of these fungi is that they can uh, change the behavior of the host or manipulate the host behavior. And by doing this, the fungus is doing something really good for them to grow and, and to, to produce spores and shoot spores and, and infect other hosts. Because for example, on the left side, we see these uh, white structures that are like emerging from the, the tree trunk. And, but in the middle, we can see the, the ants. So the ants are parasitized by the fungus but the fungus, instead of growing that big stalk from the back of the head, in these species here, they grow underneath the bark and they cripple underneath the, the moss and the bark and just emerge eventually with these uh, white structures or these structures on the, on the right side, on the letter F. So this curved structure with the look like a drop at, at the top. So those are a drop of, um, those is, this is a drop of spore. And this drop has many spores which are uh, sticky. So once these uh, passing by ants uh, touch these structures, they will get infected by these new spores. And the fact that they are anchored by, uh, by these fungal structures, if the host is removed or, or the, the host fall, the fungal structures will remain attached to the substrate and will keep infecting more and more ants as they, they climb up. Or in another case on the right side, we see on the, especially on the layer D and E and F, which we see the, the ant biting on the, the, the tip of these spines or the tip of uh, uh, liana, for example, on the letter F. 
but every single morning, a drop of dew will form there by condensation and the, the water that uh, runs down from the, the tree canopy will get uh, condensed and, and accumulated at this tip of the, the, these spines. So the fungus will, by driving the, the ant to die onto that specific location, the fungus is ensuring that it will have uh, their uh, water source supplied every day. Because if this ant was biting somewhere else up there in the tree, this water would just run through and would not accumulate. So this is a really uh, effective way to, to uh, get water every day. Another interesting case that the, the behavior manipulation or the zombification cause is this species of Dolicoderus, which is a type of ant that lives in the Brazilian Amazon and they nest on the canopy. But they get, once they get infected, they go down to the base of the trunk to, to die among this moss that, that grows Octoblepharo albidum and that they grow on the, on, on the base of these big, large trunks in the large trees in the Amazon. And these fungus drive the ants to go down from their nest to, down to the, uh, the base of the trunk to die there. But in this case, they are particularly interesting because the moss uh, sporophyte, which are these tiny uh, stalks that grow, they look very, very similar to the fungus. So it's even hard to tell which one is the fungus. So one is the fungus, another is the, is the moss. So, but this, is, this one is the fungus and the one down there is the moss. So the fungus looks strikingly similar to this moss, like this, not the green, the green is the moss on, on both sides. But the, these stalks, one is the fungus and another one is the sporophyte. So they mimic, the fungus looks, uh, the fungus mimics this moss to look exactly like them. But why? So we need to still understand and study more these species to learn why they look so similar. Another interesting fact of this behavior manipulation is that in the Amazon forest or in the tropics, they bite onto leaves. So here we can see that in only in three days, the fungus grows in a, in a very good size, a decent size for three days. But if we compare very close related species to this one that, that uh, inhabit the Amazonian forests, we compare them to species that grow here in uh, South Carolina, for example, we see that the South Carolina species uh, needs one whole year to, com to complete their life cycle. So they get infected in July, as we can see on the left side. And they on the day 17, they, they grew more or less what the Amazonian species takes only two or three days to grow. In South Carolina, they take 17 days. But to reach the maturity, it will have to overwinter during the winter. And just the next summer, it will complete their life cycle. So it, it's a very, very different uh, life cycle and requirements that these species are, although they are very similar and, and very close related to each other. If we plot these species into a map, we see that basically all the records we have for the tropics, for the tropical forests in Brazil or, or in Asia, and we see that they are biting onto leaves, which these uh, uh, green icons means. And if we compare to species in the North America, for example, or in Japan, we see that they bite onto twigs, which are represented by these uh, brown icons. So these are very interesting adaptations that these fungi had to make because if this, they bite onto leaves here in North America as well, on, in the fall, the leaves would fall down on the ground and the fungus would not be able to complete their life cycle. So these lineages that were uh, occupying more uh, temperate forests, more far from the tropics, they got, they had to develop, or better saying, they, the lineages that bite onto twigs were selected over those ones that bite onto leaves because the twigs are always there. Doesn't matter if summer or winter, the twigs are there. And if the, the ants are biting onto twig instead of a, a leaf, it will be able to complete their whole life cycles within one year. So this is, was a really great uh, innovation for this fungi that was shaped by the environment and enable them to occupy more decent places from the tropics. But not only uh, ants that are infected by these fungi, there are also other examples. For example, on the left side, 
we see a, a beetle larva that infected by Ophiocordyceps clavata um, going on the, on the clock, clock side oriented. So we see the Cordyceps needles infecting a, a spider in the, this uh, red fungus, Acanthomyces that infect adult moths, Ophiocordyceps saugana ecula that infect um, uh, social cockroaches in Japan, or these really large, these wasps are this size. They are really large wasps and they're infected on the ground by this orange fungus. Or spiders that are commonly found here in Florida with this Gibelula, one of the most beautiful entomopathogens. That's Gibelula you can find here in Florida on your backyard. So I've, I found yesterday, I found one, one here on my backyard yesterday. And we have hypocrellas as well, and these infecting hemiprons. And many other groups of, fun, of uh, insects are infected by these fungi. And these fungi are really great for uh, outreach and for uh, uh, talking to the, the broader public and, and to, to teach people how, how interesting the, these uh, fungi and mushrooms are and how interesting are their life cycles and how, how, how interesting are their natural history behind the, all the science the scientists do. And there's so much interesting things to be, to be discovered yet there might be on your back door, on your backyard. So you, we never know where these fungi are. So the reasons that these fungi get more famous is because they are really interesting. And these uh, documentaries have shown that. And also in, in the magazines, and they have featured in many, many places. So if you are interested to learn more about them, you can type up, uh, about uh, zombie ants or entomopathogens, and there will be links for National Geographic, New York Times, and many other places that you can find this information about them, especially these really uh, charismatic zombie ants and museum exhibits. They are often feature in, in museum exhibits. So we, you might be able to find more information or you can reach out to the Florida Museum people and ask me questions as well about them. So I'd like to thank you, the Florida Museum for the, the invitation to talk a little bit about this super cool fungi. My family that always support me in this, studying these crazy organisms across the globe and Matt Smith that also invited me to give a talk here. And thank you very much, you all, for being here with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was fascinating. And we have had a lot of questions roll in. And luckily, Matthew and Sarah have been answering some in chat. Um, and hopefully, we can get to the rest. Um, so I am going to go ahead and start. Um, Susie asked near the beginning of your talk, can a human with microsporidia infect a mosquito with this organism when it bites? Not that I know, because they are intracellular parasites. And these parasites are really uh, specific to the host they infect. So a microsporidium fungus that infects uh, ant, for example, wouldn't be able to infect a human at the same time because their enzymatic machi machinery is very different to infect insects and infect uh, humans. Great. Um, and William has asked, um, have any of these fungal species been used purposefully for mosquito control? Not, not that I know of. But we are, we are still in the really, really beginning to understand their life cycle and the biology behind these fungi. So we know very little about them. So we, we need to know much more about their diversity, where they are, and how they infect their hosts. And then we will be able to talk about how, how to use it for uh, human purposes. But we are still developing their, their basic science first. Great. And then um, Debriana asked, I've seen the zombie ants before in a nature documentary. They also showed other insects being infected. Is there some kind of fungi that go after small mammals or other animals? Yeah, there are, there are fungus that infect humans, mammals. There are fungal parasites for mostly every uh, live, living being in nature. But Any they are not related to these ones I showed. These ones I showed are specific to insects and arthropods in general, but they are not able to, to switch from infecting a, a spider to jump to us and make us sick. So it's not possible. There are other groups that do that. Any fungi that um, 
are that can infect small mammals that turn us into zombies? No, not at all. All right. Not uh, yet. Not yet. Yeah, we just don't know. <laughs> uh, and then William was asking in regards to the video, do you know how time, how much time lapse there was? Was it just hours or days? And I know that you showed the difference between the South Carolina ones taking longer. Mm -hmm. But do you happen to know? Yeah, the, the time lapse, the second time lapse I, I did with National Geographic five years ago. And that image, that image with the stalk growing took about five days, four days. Oh, that's really fast. Yeah, in the Amazon they're fast. In the, in the temperate forest, they are they are much slower to grow. And then um, Roz is asking, do these fungi produce chemicals and is that how they control the insects? Well, we, we still don't know how exactly they control insects, which, which molecules are, are, are being produced at exactly the, that moment when they are being manipulated. But there's a colleague of mine studying that in Florida. So she is at the University of Central Florida. Her name is Charissa De Becker. So you can reach out to her. She is the, the, the leading person now studying how these molecules affect and which genes are being expressed at the exact moment of the manipulation. So she is more into these things, but we're, we still didn't nail it yet. We don't know which molecule exactly do that and which mechanisms are involved. There are some hypotheses, but we actually don't know yet how they do that. Great, thank you. And then um, this one I think is really interesting because I think it's a brood tenure for the cicadas, um, but we have, does the fungus that infects 17 year cicadas also lie dormant for 17 years? Yeah, these spores, these spores can, can remain in the environment for many, many years. Yeah. Fantastic. And, 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 and the cicada story, not specifically the massospora, but we have just found that there is a lineage of the Ophiocordyceps, which are these fungi I showed, that they switch from being parasites to become endosymbiotic, endosymbiotic of cicadas. So instead of killing them, they are benef benefiting the cicadas now. So they gave up of being parasites and just let's, let's be friends and cooperate so they can be transmitted all to the offspring. So the rate of re infection is 100%. So this is very efficient. So becoming mutualist, mutualistic rather than parasitic can be more advantageous. I really like the image of them sitting around singing Kumbaya. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then um, William is asking if you have a zombie insect collection or is it really hard to preserve them like in these photos? Yes, well, when I collect these fungi in Brazil or Africa, and I dry them first and then bring the pins as insect collections or in the vials, small vials. So I, 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 can, I need to dry them first because if I don't dry them, other fungi will grow on top of each other and, and then we lost our sample because we'll be consumed by others. Just, just quickly showing that sitting here on my desk, I, I found this yesterday. So this is a, it's hard to see, I know, but this is a fly with two mushrooms, one of each other, one of each side. Can you, so I found in a twig here on my backyard in Gainesville yesterday. So they, they are really common. It's just a matter of going out and try to find them. I hope that everyone adds that to their scavenger hunt, even if it's not on your paper. Uh, and then John is asking that he, well, he's up in Pennsylvania and he's suddenly seeing many more acanthomyces. Do you know if their range is increasing? Not that I know, it's just people that are getting more interested on them and starting to find. And if, if one person decided to start hunting these fungi, so the first year they will find an X number and the second year X plus 10 and the third year two X. And if in 10 years you're finding hundred X more than your first year. So it's just a matter of getting your eye trains, going out to the forest, seeing things, and then you get your eyes get more comfortable and more used. And as soon as you, your eye screen is just a, one alarm will sound in your head. So for me, when I'm walking on the forest and I see anything on the, on the tip of these twigs, I, I just ring a bell and I need to check. And often they are actually an insect with a fungus. So it's just keep practicing and you find more and more. We just have to hone in our search images. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm going to back um, go back to Laurel for a second because we did have a question 
um, asking if lichens are edible. Um, and one person mentioned that cladonia can be added to soup stocks, but I was wondering if you had any other words on are lichens edible? Uh, sure. Let me uh, share my screen again. Okay. Um, so, yes, some lichens are edible, but not all lichens are edible. Um, some will kill you. Um, so, their lichens have a lot of really cool chemistry, like some glow under UV light and others will change color with a drop of bleach or KOH. Um, and that means that the lichens can be used for lots of different things. There's a lot of people use lichens for dyeing, for dyes. Um, Chanel also used Avernia prunastri for <laughs> perfume for a couple of centuries. Uh, although recently, France just said, nope, this is a religion. you can't use it anymore. But the species was in decline anyways from overuse. So it has been used in perfumes. Also, a lot of these chemicals have things that are teas, can be put in for teas or um, foods. Um, and then I would say that, you know, if you look in the Bible, the, they, they're out there in the desert and they're like, oh, we need food. What comes tumbling around? Oh, it's, it's mana. And so the mana might actually be a vagrant lichen, you know, like tumbleweed is just tumbling around in the desert. Um, and so some lichens can be edible. Most aren't terribly, most of them we don't know, but others will kill you. <laughs> like Lotharia um, or vul Vulpina. Some of them are called wolfbane. Um, so they're like odorless, tasteless. So you just mash them up, you put them in like a dead carcass and then it kills a wolf. So, and there's one psychedelic one in South America, but. Um, so variety. Yeah, but the other thing about lichens and eating them is that like, we don't, they grow, most of them grow really slowly. It's not a sustainable food source. So like, don't eat them if you don't really have to, because they might not grow back quick enough to be eaten again for another generation or two. Wow, good to consider. Um, and some folks are wondering where they take fungal findings for IDs. And I know Jowl um, put his information. I was just wondering though, does iNaturalist do any kind of identification for fungi as well? I've used them for other things, but I haven't really looked into the fungus. Yeah, iNaturalist does there are identifications. The other big one would be mushroomobserver.com. Great. Um, and then this is still for you, Laurel. Um, this was asked near the beginning. Ed asked, how much genetic variability are the encapsulated algae? Cyanobacteria within the lichen? And then I was told by Sarah, because she's a scientist, to ask along with that. Um, Will the same two primary symbionts always produce the same lichen or is there some plasticity? Oh, yeah. So that was my master's. <laughs> um, and we could talk about that for a couple of hours. But the short answer is um, that a fungal species can often, it's hard because we don't, we know, we, when you look at it, we, the genetics are much better that we can, we know now with DNA, like what is a fungal species, but what exactly is a, an algal or cyanobacterial species? That boundary is still very fluid. There's no characters, morphological characters that we can really use. So we're relying on genetic um, sequencing. So I think the best answer that I can, say is that like if you have a, a fungus here um, and then you have like a phylogenetic tree and there's like lots of branches that fungus sometimes can you know uh, associate with different sandal different species of a photobiont but oftentimes it's just different strains different fungal species can use the same photobiont um, but some 
are like a very exclusive one-to-one -one relationship. Um, and it really depends. <laughs> um, it's really kind of crazy, but yeah, the network, a lot of them do share. The more sampling you do, the more you find that they're sharing and they're using, the fungus is using what symbiont is locally available. I like it. This seems like such a peaceful group, even though we're talking about fungus and zombies and things that'll kill you. Um, our last lichen question, um, Sue Min asks, how much is lichen similar to corals? Corals are polyps in symbiosis with zoanthellae, which provides nutrients to polyps via photosynthesis. So are there any similarities going on? Well, I think, isn't that, I thought that's also, I think, a, like a sandal bacteria. Um, but, you know, the coral doesn't have hyphae. So in some ways it's, in a broad sense, I think it's just a, a, an example of convergent evolution where like different organisms end up doing the same thing to survive. But in terms of like the structure of how the symbiosis works, I think it's pretty different. Okay. And then this one, I think, can go to um, all of the panelists. Um, and we're going back to the one I asked during the original question series. Uh, are there any diseases or fungi that can cause a post-apocalyptic scenario that is often depicted in TV shows and movies? Inquiring minds want to know. I'll answer that. <laughs> uh, not that we know of. Laurel already sort of answered that, but I, I think that um, there's all, so one of the things that's really interesting about fungi is that new types of interactions and new species are still being discovered all the time. I think probably there won't be any that will cause a um, zombie infection of humans that will create a post-apocalyptic scenario, but we have seen the emergence of some diseases in particular animal groups. So some examples of that would be the, the chytrid disease of frogs that was mentioned in the chat earlier um, that, that has emerged and was not known to be important. Um, like in the 1990s, it started to become clear that it was really a big problem for amphibians. And so that was an emerging disease that existed before, but has become really problematic. And another example of that would be white nose bat disease, which is another fungus that's, and in that case, um, has caused really catastrophic effects for some species of bats. Um, and so there, there are examples of animal diseases. I would say in general, um, many warm blooded animals don't seem to have as many diseases caused by fungi, but it doesn't mean that they can't get fungal diseases. And there are certainly some that infect humans and other warm blooded mammals. Fantastic. Did any other panelists want to add to that? Any last minute thoughts? I don't think you would see any zombie apocalyptic lichens. I, I, going back to the mana, I think you're more likely to see like in the future, if there is an apocalypse that people will go back to eating lichens more. I like um, well, not an apocalypse, but I, I, I could think about um, like what we, is, we are seeing now with COVID with a type of yeast. For example, they found a yeast in Brazil, I think few, two months ago, a few months ago, that is really, really deadly. So nearly 100% of people die if they get these, these yeast on their lungs. So this is really serious and, and they are fungi. So fungi can kill people and many people. I know the people that have died on, on because of, of fungi in their lungs, a disease of that. So this is, would one be apocalyptic and iconic as the, this fungi, these uh, movies want a picture, but certainly fungi can be a really bad threat for human health. So no fun of being a zombie, just death. This, this isn't the note we want to end on. So we're going to go back one time. Um, it was talking about when I had asked about the Ascos and the Basidio. So um, 
it's a person commented that it was stated that lichen only associate with ascos, but I've read that a basidiomycetic yeast was discovered in Vulpina. And then further studies found a tremula species, mainly wondering if more research has been put into the interaction with the tremula being that it is a parasitic genus. There were con was conjecture that it may be a binding agent and I've been dying for more info. Any, any panelists want to tackle that one? I, I think I know where the question's going. Um, and it's, it's not an easy thing because this subject is so new. But basically, um, in that slide where I had, I said that there were like other organisms involved. There's a species of Vulpina. Um, I don't remember, I think it was two different species. One like had a really distinct chem chemistry and one had like no chemistry, no secondary chemicals. And it was because of this yeast. And so then that's kind of what prompts people to think, well, you know, maybe that's why we haven't made a lichen in a lab um, is because there's more than one component. And so in some ways, that how important the yeast is, is not really clear to us yet because not every lichen has that yeast or species of that yeast. And so for the production of that secondary chemical, that yeast is really important. Um, and so it's kind of a, we need much more studies just to figure out like, what are all these like different fungi doing and bacteria doing inside the lichen? And then maybe once we figure out some of these complex interactions, then we might be able to um, really kind of dive into a deeper level about what a symbiosis is in the lichen and more broadly. All right, thank you for for helping answer that one. And then um, the last question to all of the panelists, and really the last one this time, I know I keep slipping more in, but they just keep coming up and they're great. Um, so there was a question earlier about useful chemicals. Um, and so since both of the group of fungi that we've been talking about today have some evidence of useful chemicals, I was just hoping that y'all could touch on that before we head out today. Well, I can give you one example of a chemical that was extracted and discovered through a fungus, which was cyclosporin, which is uh, currently used for uh, organ transplantation to, to help with the rejection of these new organs. So this cyclosporin was, was uh, extracted and discovered from a polypocladium in flatum, which is a, a cyst, no, it's not a cyst, it's close related to Ophiocordyceps, the same family. So it's really close related to the zombie ant fungus. So we got the medicine to help us with the organ transplant. So this was a huge step uh, made due to the new study with uh, fungi. So this was great. With lichens, um, I think some of the most important things that we'll start seeing from them in the future is a lot grow in very moist soil habitats along rivers, and they have a lot of antimicrobial um, compounds that help to help for defenses. So I expect we'll maybe see some new antibiotics from that. And then also a lot of lichens live up in the canopy. They get a lot of sunlight. And so whoever figures out how to sequence or sorry, to synthesize those chemicals, compounds, um, might have a really billion dollar sunscreen idea. Fantastic. All right, so we are gonna wrap up for today. I'm gonna go ahead and drop in the chat our next event for the Florida Museum. And we have a fantastic keynote speaker coming. It's Robin Wall Kemmerer, who is an 
indigenous author and a PhD in botany and her connection between um, Mother Earth and how people should be treating it and what we receive from Mother Earth is fantastic. So she'll be with us on March 18th and the event is um, linked there. Thank you everyone for attending this event and a big thank you to the panelists as well as Sarah for really handling chat just incredibly. I really appreciate that. Uh, we are also going to put a link to a survey that you can do. Um, so I've dropped it there. When you close your Zoom, that link will pop up again. And you'll also receive an email tomorrow with that link. You only have to do it one time, but we would really appreciate any feedback that you can provide. So thank you for attending today. We appreciate having you and have a great afternoon. Bye.